Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to Crash Course Economics or welcome back. It's nice to see you all here. So today we'll feature the third webinar of our fourth Crash Course series on rentier and monopoly capitalism. I'd like to introduce, uh, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. So just say who you are, where you're based and at which institutions you work. So my name is Sarah. I'm a project manager at the Sustainable Finance Lab and at the Transnational Institute. And I'll be today's host together with Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have a theme consisting of Jeremy Krollsmith, our web developer and tech guy, Jenny Pannebecker, communications officer at SOMO and Case Stott from Global Info, who are working very hard as always to make this webinar into a success. So before we go to tackle the heart of the matter, I want to introduce you to Crash Course. Uh, so in case you don't know us, we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations. And we united at the start of the COVID crisis in order to understand how COVID changes the world and to reflect on the challenges we're faced with and also think about possible solutions. Today, of course, there's a, a multiple crisis we're facing. So uh, all the more urge to reflect on these issues. Uh, Crash Course is a platform designed to open up debate on how we can move out of these multiple crises. And uh, we want to, of course, achieve social, economic and ecological justice for all. But how do we do it? So first, we need to understand the world before changing it. And therefore, we're inviting global experts to break down complex issues and make them accessible to you all. So we can shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. This time, uh, we will be discussing how a few corporate giants gained significant control over market access, technology and resources, which allowed them to extract increasingly substantial rents to the detriment of smaller competitors and also undermining stringent regulation and our democracies altogether. So this is the third out of four webinars in this series taking place every two weeks. And in every webinar, we provide you with a one hour crash course on a specific subject that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a bit better. You can watch all our former series and webinars on our website, crashcourseeconomics.org. And of course, also of this episode, there will be a recording, a podcast and a summary online. Rodrigo, may I pass on to you? Uh, yes, Sarah. Uh, so this is the third episode uh, on the series uh, of uh, on monopoly capitalism uh, and rentier capitalism. Um, and today we will be talking about big pharma, big pharma next to big tech. Yeah, these are two sectors that really show how yeah monopoly power and monopoly capitalism today is working out for some and not for the many. Uh, so. Yeah, this really fits well in our uh, series on monopoly capitalism. Um, so back to you, Sarah. Yeah, so just very practically, uh, so you know how the webinar works. So Rodrigo will shortly introduce today's speaker. And thereafter, Rodrigo and I will interview the speaker for about half an hour, 40 minutes. We've prepared some questions and topics. And then finally, we also have a round of questions from you. Uh, and those will be read out by Rodrigo and me. So in total, it's one hour and we finish at uh, five o'clock uh, sharply. So if you have a question during the, the speaker's talk or during uh, the questionnaire, uh, please put your question in a special Q&A tab, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. And we'll make a selection based on all the questions that you favored. And if you like a question, you can upvote it with a thumbs up. So please do that if you think a question is particularly good. So, Rodrigo, you have the honor to introduce today's speaker. Yes. So, um, we're very happy to have uh, with us uh, Nick Dearden. He's uh, an activist, a campaigner uh, for over 20 years, working on issues on uh, corporate globalization. Uh, uh, he is the director of the British NGO uh, Global Justice Now. And last October, um, yeah. Uh, this book came out at Verso um, uh, called uh, The Pharmaceutical Industry, uh, Pharm Pharmanomics, How Big Pharma Destroys Global Health. Uh, and so, as we were discussing before, uh, before this, uh, yeah, Nick has been uh, working on a campaign on Big Pharma for, for some years. So yeah, maybe it would also be good to, to dig into that a little bit. But uh, yeah, before we go there, I would like to... Um, yeah, go straight to to the book and to the to the content. Um, so there's many issues you describe 
uh, in this book. But uh, yeah, if we would like to yeah get more familiar with what pharmanomics is about, okay. um, uh, yeah, I thought a good entry entry point would be to discuss what you also label as financialization. Um, and so in your, in your in your book, you you emphasize that there are three parts to corporate financialization uh, that are relevant for the pharmaceutical sector. So the, the first one is um, maximizing shareholder value or maximizing payouts to, to, to shareholders. Uh, the second involves um, yeah, growing debt and cash holdings by these firms. Uh, and the third uh, revolves around intangible assets. So um, yeah, my, my, my question basically is, yeah, could you guide us through these different components and, and, and tell us yeah, what this business model, this financialized business model looks like? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Rodrigo. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it's great to be here. It's been a, a great series so far, so I'm really honored to be um, to be part of it. Um, and I should say on your question, I mean, I think it's a it's a great question because for me, financialization um, underlies the growth of monopoly power in the neoliberal economy over the last 40 years. Um, and I should say that those metrics you pick out really, I'm indebted to you uh, and 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 other experts like you for those metrics because financialization has been a uh, a kind of uh, buzzword, buzz term for, for several years now. Um, but it's really hard to get at the heart of what it means and how you can measure it. Um, and so I thought it was great that um, that, that, that you and, and experts like you kind of gave us these three measures as a way of showing whether an economy was financialized. And I used it um, to look at the, the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so yeah, I mean, shareholder value, for me, this is utterly critical as to how we've developed over the last 40 years an economy which is almost obsessed with short-term profit maximization at the expense of everything else. The mechanism for doing that is, 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 is so clearly about creating a series of incentives, often um, through a CEO directly saying CEO pay is dependent upon um, shareholder return, or indeed CEO pay largely is made up of shares. Um, and therefore it affects the CEO um, as well. But shareholder value, um, absolutely critical. And the idea that the primary duty of a private corporation is returning as much as they possibly can to their shareholders, not reinvesting in their business and not investing in their staff or their factories or whatever else it is, but returning money to shareholders. And in the case of the pharmaceutical industry, you know, that you, you can see it very, very clearly. So between 2000 and 2018, um, and this may be a, a, a figure you originally quoted, uh, Rodrigo, the 27 biggest uh, pharmaceutical corporations uh, in the world saw a 400% increase in the money that they return to shareholders every year, taking it from around 30 billion in 2000 to around $146 billion uh, a year uh, by 2018. So absolutely huge amount. And when I looked at individual pharmaceutical corporations, you find every year, you know, almost without fail, um, the amount that those corporations return to their shareholders, it well exceeds research and development budgets. Uh, in many years, even, even uh, exceeds the amount that they bring in in profit, even exceeds their net income. We seem incredibly counterintuitive to people. I mean, how can this be that they're paying their shareholders out more than they're actually making uh, in, in profit in a year? And that brings you to the second metric, which is which is uh, debt and cash holdings, uh, which kind of holds up this whole system. So the, you know, like the neoliberal economy is based upon, upon debt, upon increasing uh, uh, amounts of uh, so-called investment, but by which you're, you're essentially taking debt on. Uh, that and allows you to grow your operations ever bigger, allows you to, to develop monopoly positions, merchants, acquisitions, all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it comes with a cost. And the cost is you are beholden to the people who've lent you this money. And the people who've lent you this money have lent you this money often, not entirely, but often, not because they care deeply about the development of medicines, but because they think you can give them a better return than anybody else in the marketplace. So you are competing against every other economic entity. Um, to return as much as you possibly can to these investors and shareholders. Uh, so that's the second bit of the equation. And then intellectual property, which I know we'll come on to, and intangible assets. I mean, you know, the, the, these are things like patents, like copyrights, like trademarks, which have become so important 
to the balance sheets of all manner of corporations. And I mean, in the book, I go back to the to the 90s and, and, and looking at Naomi Klein's work, No Logo, in which she describes this enormous change taking place in global capitalism um, from, from, from where um, corporations began to realize that what was the really profitable bit, what really added value to what they were doing uh, was not the stuff they were actually making. It was not the McDonald's hamburgers or the Levi's jeans. It was the trademark. It was the name. It was the brand. Um, because actually what they were producing was no different to what anyone else was producing. What was important was the market power that was given to them by these intangible assets. And for the pharmaceutical industry, it wasn't so much the brand, but it was another form of intangible asset patents. And the pharmaceutical industry recognized in the 90s that what was really important to it was not its factories or even its research per se, was not its staff, um, was its patents. And they set about creating a framework in which they could squeeze as much as possible out of their patents, regardless of the cost to the rest of society, regardless in some senses of the cost of their own business model, which I think we'll, 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 we'll come on to um, talk about. But certainly today, you know, these, these patents, these intangible assets are absolutely at the heart of big pharma um, profits, um, at the heart of the big pharma um, balance sheets. Um, and that has, as we'll come on to talk about, really profound implications for how this, for how this business model works. But you know, in short, uh, this is an industry which is a result of being hyper-financialized, I would say. You know, I mean, this has happened to all sorts of businesses and industrial sectors throughout our society. But I would say Big Pharma um, really was in the vanguard of this move. And it's no surprise that you know, a former hedge fund manager like Martin Shkreli, you know, who became this kind of pharma bro, you know, in an interview said, why did you, know, he was asked, why did you, why did you start a pharmaceutical company? And he said, well, I came from hedge funds and I realized that hedge funds couldn't make me as much money as pharmaceutical companies can. Yeah. So about this uh, intellectual property business model, could you elaborate a bit more on that also? Eh? How, how, how does it indeed imply uh, consequences for society? What are, what are we experiencing that respect um, and why is it so problematic, you think? Well, patents and intellectual property in general is very interesting, isn't it? Because we've been told for the last 40 years, everything's about, you know, free markets and perfect competition and so on. And of course, we know we've discovered throughout your, your crash course series, and that's not really the case at all. But, but, but patents, you know, it's really obviously not the case. I mean, what patents do is they give individual corporations complete monopolies over the production of certain medicines. And the, 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 the logic behind that is, well, it's very costly to produce medicine. If you simply allow somebody else to begin producing it on day one, um, you're never going to be able to recoup uh, the money that, you're, that you've made from that investment, and therefore you will disincentivize the creation of new medicines. But actually what we found is, as patents have become stronger and stronger, tighter and tighter, more and more stringent, over the last 40 years. And that's one of the, that's one of the big um, developments that's happened in the neoliberal period. The patents have become more and more enforceable, more widespread, deeper, more extensive. Actually, it hasn't, it hasn't bolstered innovation at all. And I think, you know, what I try and do is trace why that's the, the case. And, and essentially why it's the case is um, the, the, pharmace the pharmaceutical industry has become addicted to making absolutely sky high profits through this financialization process. And it's recognized that patents are the number one uh, aspect of its business model that allows them to do that. And so if you're really interested in maximizing the, the amount of money you're making out of your patents, then what you need to be thinking about is not, you know, am I employing really great researchers and medical experts? It's am I employing really great lawyers and lobbyists? Because it's the lawyers and lobbyists that are going to enforce your patent rights and ensure that your patents are even more enforceable and even stronger in the future. And so that's what the pharmaceutical industry has spent the last 40 years doing. And it's actually degraded its research and development capacity. It's degraded its productive capacity in order to put as much as it possibly can into uh, maxing out patents. And the, the consequences of that are, are, are really quite um, stark. So, most of us think, and, and this is a this is a story that's been that's been uh, woven by um, the, the big pharma industry for many years now to ward off regulation and so on. Well, 
okay, we might have problems with the way the pharmaceutical industry makes its money. We might not think they're very nice. We may think they're pretty greedy and their medicines are expensive, but at least we have medicines. Because you imagine a world without medicines and that's very frightening. It's frightening to me. Um, and so they've kind of told us this story where you have to put up with all of this because at the end of the day, we make your medicines. But actually, the more they've told that story and the more they've become dependent on financial markets and on intellectual property, the less they've made on medicines. And what I discovered is these aren't really medical research institutions anymore. And that's a, that's a product of this reliance on patents. It's a product of this reliance on financial markets. They've, they actually behave more like hedge funds now. Yeah, if, I, if I just can uh, come in briefly just to, yeah, to summarize how, how I understand also your book and, and, and other research is that um, yeah, large pharmaceutical firms used to do research, uh, bring out uh, new drugs uh, and so on. And now increasingly they buy up intellectual property from other firms. So they are, it's, it's, it's through mergers and acquisitions, uh, taking on debt yeah, and then growing through mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and so they are appropriating intellectual property often created by public money, public institutions. And they are the ones with their connections and their market power that are able to convert it into to power, uh, into money, so they can monetize it uh, and through their specific uh, yeah, connections they have. Um, That's and exactly so, right. Yeah. And so what, what would be a, a long-term consequence of this? Because what we're seeing is, is that the, the ones who were used to fill the pipelines of, of research and development and new drugs used to be these large pharmaceutical firms but now, yeah, that, that is drying up. They are they are buying up these uh, these princes all around them that that, that have promising uh, new drugs. But uh, so where where's, where are the new drugs coming from, and, and is there a need for new drugs? The new drugs are coming primarily from research that's funded by the public first. Now, the, the the research may be done by university departments, so it may be done in one sense by the by the public sector directly, or it may be done by small biotech companies. But wherever it's done. The only chance really of that research seeing the light of day is they get bought up by Pfizer. And the problem with that is, um, A, we're getting a very bad return for public investment, right? Because at the end of the day, these drugs are not cheap at all, and they're putting an enormous strain on our health systems. So we're paying twice for these drugs. But also the drugs that get taken forward are only getting taken forward because there's a belief that they can keep the profits at astronomically high levels of these companies. And that means you're only, you're only, you're only interested in certain types of drugs, right? You're interested in drugs which um, can ease chronic conditions for people who live in rich countries or people who are rich and, and live in the global South who can afford to pay a lot of money on an ongoing basis for a drug. Uh, cancer medicines for which, you know, the kind of the sky is the limit in terms of what, 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 what people will pay. Um, but beyond that, you know, there's, there's very little interest. In particular, for my, for my concern, as an organization interested in access to medicines around the world, there's no interest at all in, in diseases that are suffered by poorer people in poorer countries, right? You can't make any kind of profit off, off, off them. So they're not very interesting. Um, but, but you know, even here in the West, I mean, before COVID, you know, there was almost no interest in vaccines. Right? Not because vaccines can't make a profit. They can make a profit, but it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable profit. It's not an astronomical profit. Um, so vaccines weren't very interesting. Antibiotics, there's very little interest in, in, in developing new or alternative um, antibiotics, which is one of the reasons, you know, we're, we are facing an absolute, you know, what, what has been called an antibiotic apocalypse, you know, where by 2050, you're looking at tens of millions of people who will be dying every year of previously preventable diseases because, you know, any, any uh, anti new antibiotic or alternative antibiotic you bring online today, you're only going to use very, very sparingly Pharmaceutical companies can't make a lot of money for that while they remain under patent. So the, the, the diseases that are causing pandemics, the diseases that are causing mass death among people who aren't rich, um, but also, you know, diseases that may cause mass death for us too, are not really interesting to the pharmaceutical industry. And actually what they spend most of that time doing is not even producing these blockbusters. It's making tiny tweaks to drugs they already own so that they can apply for new monopolies on it. Right? Now, the worst I came across in the book, which is an extreme example, but was a company had put a powder pill into a plastic capsule and applied for a new patent on it. You could pull the 
capture all the part and the powder pill fell out, right? I mean, you're talking about the lowest possible change they can make to a medicine and also be granted a new patent on it. And that's one of the reasons why in research study after research study, they found of the medicines that come onto the market every year, you know, only a small fraction of them are a tiny fraction of them are genuine breakthroughs and, and, and only a minority of them are, 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 are even a minor benefit on what was already on the market because that's what's driving the, those are the incentives in the industry. It's not about making medicines that we need to create healthier societies or to fight the diseases that are most problematic. Yeah, maybe let's zoom in a little bit on something that we all experienced recently, the pandemic, which was, I think, also very blatantly an example of public investments, expenditures and, and private gains, right? So there we witnessed how the pharmaceutical sector and mainly like the big four greatly benefited from the pandemic, both financially, so huge profits, but also in terms of reputation, right? They were all of a sudden like the, the great um, heroes of, of the pandemic. Whereas, yeah, as you also rightly state, they had hardly invested in vaccines to fight epidemics like these in the in the preceding years. And most actually of the COVID vaccines or COVID-like vaccines uh, were developed so swiftly uh, because of the huge amount of public money that was spent on, on former research, right? So, um, yeah, maybe also more from a, from a campaigner perspective. So how, how did this narrative shift? Because... I think a lot of people are quite concerned about the power of big pharma and they know this is going on. A lot of people know how, how the IP issue works, but still with the pandemic, all of a sudden it was like, oh, amazing. And they did it so fast and they're the new heroes, right? So how did this happen? And then a follow-up question would be, did governments learn anything from, from this situation? Do you see any change in, in their policy uh, regarding how they relate to big pharma? But also, yeah, I mean, championing big pharma uh, as as the big winners of the pandemic, I think, has also very bad consequences for how people perceive big pharma. Very much. Well, they did some great PR, didn't they? And, and I mean, they were honest about that. I mean, an interview with um, Albert Baller, the head of Pfizer, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the middle of the pandemic. And he said, this is not just about profits. It's also about how we, you know, how, how, how we um, create a better image for ourselves. Because at the time, Pfizer had been rated, you know, like the least popular uh, company in the least popular se sector in the United States. So, you know, they they really went to town in terms of uh, trying to convince the public um, that we've created these life-saving, pandemic-ending uh, drugs in record time. We've got them to a record number of people's arms, and that's why you need us at the end of the day. And the truth, and this is one of the reasons I wrote the book, really, was because that's not what happened at all. I mean, back in you know, 2018, the World Health Organization was absolutely desperate for big pharma companies to begin investing in pathogens that could cause an, an epidemic. Hardly any of them were doing anything. You know, coronavirus, nothing at all, you know, even though that had caused epidemics in other parts of the world. It was all public research um, or publicly paid for research. Um, and then, you know, the amount of public money on the table went stratospheric when the pandemic actually broke out. You know, the US Operation Warp Speed alone put $17 billion on the table, essentially just handed over um, to these companies so that they could begin um, take, you know, taking the research that had already been done by the public sector and turning it into vaccines you could get into, into people's arms. Um, and I mean, th this wasn't just like campaigners like me complaining about this. I mean, there's a great quote from an FT article uh, uh, in, in the book from an um, a member of the American administration who was negotiating with Pfizer to try to buy um, Pfizer vaccines at a reasonable price. Pfizer were trying to charge $100 a shot for their vaccine. And this guy, you know, you can kind of see him tearing his hair out. And he's like, but it isn't even Pfizer's vaccine. The fact we call it Pfizer's vaccine is one of the biggest marketing coups in the history of this sector. Yeah. So, um, so, but, and, and, but I think there the was also an awareness. And there was a particular awareness, of course, among the many, many countries in the global south who were getting none of these vaccines, you know, uh, particularly the mRNA vaccines. I mean, there was nothing on the table for them. Um, and, and that was essentially because Pfizer and Moderna sold everything to the, to the richest countries in the world. Um, they said, we'll get, to, we'll get to everyone else at some point in the pandemic. Of course, they never did because, you know, a year into the pandemic, then rich countries needed to buy boosters. Uh, third doses, fourth doses, and they never they never got to those um, countries. But that was a wake up call, and I think it was a wake up call, particularly 
particularly for the richer developing countries. So countries that, like South Africa, like Brazil, that aren't used to being right at the back of the queue and suddenly found themselves in exactly the same position as the poorest countries in the world, just can't get hold of anything. And that was a huge wake up call. And those countries have been told for years now, well, don't worry, you don't need to have all of your own research and development. You don't need to have your own manufacturing facilities. You can rely on the market. You can import stuff, right? We don't need to do everything ourselves. Well, they couldn't. You know, when the shit hit the fan, they couldn't. Um, and, you know, they, they also couldn't rely on, on any form of charity. I mean, there was almost no donations. I mean, apart from the United States, the only country that gave any substantial donations at all, uh, no one else really gave anything uh, meaningful. Um, so they, so, so they, they, they woke up to it. I, I also think, I have to say, and I think this is interesting, I think it was a bit of a wake-up call for the United States government too. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons um, that Biden, uh, fairly early in the pandemic, came out and said he supported a waiver of intellectual property. Because you see, the thing is not just that, that, that we weren't selling this stuff or that we weren't donating this stuff to other countries. It was that we wouldn't give them the know-how to produce it themselves. And that was the thing that I think people really couldn't get to grips with. You know, the idea that actually there's loads of factories that can make this, loads of laboratories that can make this, but you won't, Pfizer and Moderna will not share the recipes or the know-how because the intellectual property and the control of that intellectual property is hardwired into these corporations, which of course means we couldn't vaccinate hundreds of thousands, millions of people. You know, think of how many deaths could have been saved if we'd actually shared that know-how. And I think even at the level of the US administration, which has always been one of the most pro big pharma um, countries in the world, there was a recognition. Well, hang on a minute, we paid for this and you're claiming we didn't pay for it and you're, you're not taking any instruction on what we can do with the research that we paid for. That, I think, uh, uh, rankled with senior administration officials, particularly when it became clear that if you had had a vaccine and you were living in the global south, odds were, in the middle of the pandemic, you would have had a Chinese vaccine. Right? And if you think about what that means for geopolitics in the world, that was deeply worrying for the US. But the, the EU was yeah, equally adamant in, in, in protecting IP rights. Yeah, the EU was worse. Yeah. Yeah. The EU was worse. I mean, the worst countries in the world were Britain and Germany uh, and Switzerland and Norway, not very good either. They were the worst. Um, but, but would you say this episode that, well, clearly showed uh, the defects of the IP regime and how uh, unfair it is and how it clearly doesn't work for the majority of, of the planet? Uh, didn't we already see this with the HIV crisis? Uh, so, uh, but but that wasn't a, a sufficient wake-up call somehow. Yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, HIV, the HIV crisis actually happened at the very beginning of the current intellectual property regime. So I should explain, you know, in, in intellectual property is not something that I think most people think of as a trade issue, uh, right? It's not, it's not about me selling you goods and you selling me goods. But actually, because, you know, when the WTO was founded in the mid-90s, I, I mean, if effectively, trade rules became way more than we used to think about as as, as trade, free trade uh, issues, and they came to incorporate you know so much of the of the rules that underlie the global economy. And, and, and the industry, industries like pharma argued very hard. The WTO needs to oversee and enforce intellectual property rules and do that everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world needs to have the same level of intellectual property as the United States. Now, that was crazy at the time. I mean, I can't, it's, it's hard to explain how big a change that was because until the late 70s, many European countries didn't put intellectual property on medicines. It was just not the done thing. It was not considered, I mean, my own country did it fairly early after the Second World War. But even so, in the 60s, when governments couldn't get antibiotics uh, at a price they could afford, they overrode those patents and, and bought them from Italy. Uh, which didn't have intellectual property on medicines, right? So the, the idea in the mid-90s that most developing countries should put intellectual property provisions onto medicines was was quite crazy. Um, but it happened. They got it through the WTO. And and this was a big thing. Sorry, and, 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 and just to be clear, it only becomes powerful as a, as a global legal infrastructure if it applies to all countries, if there's no way out of it. And because if just a few countries have bilaterally agree to do this, you can go through another country. But if the global trade system is organized for all in such a way, you can never go around it. Is That's that right. Oh, no. it, it, it is. And one of the particularly problematic things they tried to do was to stop countries 
importing. So, you know, there was a, I mean, this, this didn't all come in in one go. In fact, for the lowest income countries in the world, it's still, you know, they're, they're still not bound by these rules. So, you know, but that's a problem in itself because many low income countries can't really, you know, will, will struggle to make some um, stuff, although not all of it. Bangladesh has a, a good pharmaceutical industry. But what they would say to the next level of countries up is you can't import that stuff. Right? So you have to abide by, the, by Western intellectual property standards, you know, if you're Brazil, Colombia. South Africa. And South Africa was the real problem because South Africa in the early 2000s, of course, HIV was was uh, was horrific, um, the way that it was tearing through society. And it was a death sentence for people, uh, despite the fact that by that point, we had drugs here in the West that you could take that would indefinitely extend your life and prevent you passing HIV on to your unborn child. Right. So we had that in the West. But you know, you were talking about it was ten thousand dollars a patient for a course. I mean, that was completely unaffordable. Nobody could afford that in South Africa. So, what the South African government did was say, "Okay, maybe we need a bit of wriggle room on these intellectual property laws. Let's give ourselves the right to import where we can't make this stuff ourselves, but we can get it much cheaper from overseas. Let's do that." And they knew that in India, by that time, you could make HIV these HIV pills for a dollar a pill. Right? So they said, we can import this and we can treat people. And as soon as they did that, 39 pharmaceutical corporations slapped a lawsuit on them, accusing them of piracy for stealing their intellectual property. And they took the ANC government to court. Now, they backed down eventually in the face of enormous public opposition, as you can imagine. Um, but it sent a chilling effect, I think, through the rest of the world because people were like, well, mm, that's a bit dangerous. We don't want, we don't want that to happen. Um, so, you know, the bullying, and that bullying, by the way, was was helped by the US government and by the European Commission as well. Um, that bullying sent a real chill, chilling effect um, uh, down the spine of, of, of countries around the world. And it's one reason, I think, that countries have been extremely uh, reticent to create their own pharmaceutical industries. And maybe this would be a good moment, uh, Sarah, for you to come in uh, with some questions on... Uh... IP protection and yeah, trade. Yeah, so I was also, well, trade for sure. I mean, I've been working on trade investment for forever. And unfortunately, it's a very underestimated topic. Maybe we should do a crash course on it one day <laughs> because there's so much enshrined in trade and investment treaties. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm wondering about what you're saying about eh, the US being concerned now. There might be some cracks in, in the system uh, because eh, a lot of vaccines uh, in the global south came from China, right? But that's more, of course, a geopolitical argument rather than anything that has to do with morality, solidarity, or what have you not. But um, I, I noticed that there are a lot of campaigns also and still ongoing during the pandemic uh, to, to waive the, the, the TRIPS uh, thing. And I, I think not, not all of them were successful, but can you point to some uh, successes and ongoing campaigns and where, where do you see uh, the next wins because indeed eh, there's a I mean there's a whole geopolitical raw about a lot of things in the world uh, critical raw materials but also eh, IP um, but of course in the end the goal should be that everyone has access to medicines right because we all have a, a right to health how to ensure that and what kind of legal uh, steps can we envision in the next years to to change the regime actually. Uh, for example, indeed, when it comes to trade and investment rules, uh, but also, yeah, the possibility of uh, of suing countries uh, if they just want to fulfill basic human rights. Absolutely. So, look, the, the the main thing we were campaigning for in the pandemic was a waiver of intellectual property um, on uh, COVID vaccines and medicines and diagnostics for the length of the pandemic. So it was a fairly reasonable and 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 limited. Could you say demand. what a waiver is, just in case? Yeah, a waiver would be um, that the intellectual property provisions at the WTO don't apply. So if a, if, 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 a, if a government decides we can make this and we want to make it, um, they can get on with it and they don't have to worry about being sued or lengthy negotiations um, with, the, with, the, with the patent holder. Um, now, that never got passed. And I, I think there were real, um, I, I mean, there was a very watered down version of it that got passed extremely late, but it wasn't what we were demanding. And I think there are lessons in there for, for campaigning on these kind of global trade rules. But I don't think that means it was a failure because what I think it did, what I think the campaign did, 
was to give um, an, an, a kind of umbrella um, of resistance to all sorts of governments and social movements around the world who thought we really need to do things differently. And there's something really interesting about the pandemic, which is actually by the end of the pandemic, how many countries have made their own vaccine? You know, there was quite a few actually that have made effective vaccines from Cuba to Vietnam, uh, to Thailand, uh, to South Africa. Um, that's new. That's really new. And South Africa went one step foot further. South Africa said, we need to know how this mRNA thing works because it's not just about COVID. mRNA is potentially a revolutionary uh, vaccine platform that could be used to inoculate against HIV, against malaria, against TB, against certain types of cancer. This cannot just be the property of a small handful of companies. They asked Pfizer and Moderna to help, actually. Pfizer and Moderna, surprisingly, did not help. Um, but they just said, with backing from the World Health Organization, we're going to do this anyway. Um, and they cracked it. They worked out how they could make one. Um, they, they weren't able to bring it online before the pandemic ended, but they're now working on a TB vaccine, I think, at the, at the mRNA help in Cape Town. <laughs> but then they also said, we're going to do something really radical here. We're going to... This, this, is, this is not something we have. We will share the know-how with all governments and producers that we think can produce this thing safely. And you know, there are 12 governments they've already shared this information with. They've come over and learned how to do it, uh, you know, including Brazil, including Argentina, um, including India. So this is this is big stuff. This is this is research and development potential, which has been stymied, I would argue, by intellectual property provisions out of the WTO for years and years and years, which is just kind of starting to happen. I mean, they're just kind of behaving like it doesn't exist. And I think that's really exciting. And I think the wake-up call to governments, even, even if they're not doing research and development, the wake-up call to governments um, around manufacturing was also huge. You know, So there are all sorts of experiments with factories being opened in, um, in many countries, in Egypt. I mean, China helped um, Egypt uh, open um, some factories to produce its vaccine and said, we'll transfer the knowledge to you. Uh, you know, so 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 that's that's really exciting. But I do think there is something that goes beyond solidarity, which is also changing in the United States, which also helps make this possible. Which is the United States, for domestic reasons, you know, the farmer industry is hating the United States because they've been able to charge whatever they want for their medicines for the longest period of time and get Getting away a lot with of people want. also, right? And of course, within the last few years, this awful opioid scandal. Um, you know, people who haven't seen painkiller, you know, it's it's a hard watch, but it's 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 well worth understanding just how deep this has gone into the American psyche. And I think, you know, that that has taken hold through the Bernie Sanders campaign, through into the Biden administration. Um, you know, big pharma has kind of become enemy number one. Um, and they are not interested in protecting the rights of this industry anymore. I'm not saying, you know, they're gonna radically transform the industry at a global level, but the United States traditionally has been one of the leading defenders of intellectual property and the pharmaceutical industry at a global level. And it is not at this moment in time playing that role. And that gives space um, for us as campaigners to push around the world governments to take that leap um, into creating their own research and development in their own industry and running those industries in radically different ways to the way that we see it being run at a global level. So what about the EU? Because you said the main problematic countries are based here, like uh, UK, Germany, some Nordics. Do you see any change here happening? There is change, uh, but it's very hypocritical. <laughs> so there is change happening in terms of how it affects us. At, at the EU, the UK, I would say, is, is not massively interested. Although e even in the UK, I mean, we've just been renegotiating the price that the National Health Service pays um, the big pharmaceutical companies for their for their products. And, and even there, the UK government was was you know pushing back on on, on what Big Pharma wanted. Um, but at the EU, there's lots and lots of talk. There's been lots of talk in the Parliament, European Parliament. There's been lots of talk in the Commission about how we deal with the fact a of another pandemic and b of the fact there are now big medicine shortages um, around Europe. So something about this system is not working. And also a recognition that even if a, even if we get another you know some big breakthrough in in in, in coming years. Our health systems, frankly, even our very well-funded health systems, are not likely to be able to afford uh, very many of the medicines that come from that. So it's kind of a recognition, even at a very high level, 
that something needs to change it. So there's been discussion about, you know, even um, in France, they've been talking about public manufacturing, you know, you know, you know more public um, elements to the industry. Uh, they've been talking about how they would override patents, compulsory licensing, it's called. I mean, this is always a right of countries, but it's a right that the EU has not tended to use and certainly not encourage other people to use. So they're now saying, Actually, no. We need to we need to consider this. This 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 may be necessary. And I think this is all part of um, the change in discourse around global economics, away from the idea of ever longer supply chains, ever more free markets. You know, let the market do its work, and everything good will come to you. That's changing, and there is a recognition of the need for state intervention, for state planning. Now, what that looks like is still up in the air, and there's a huge debate to be had around it. But there is a recognition of that. The problem with the EU at the moment, I think, is that it is still, and, and the UK, and even the US, uh, it is still blocking the demands of some countries of the WTO for relaxation of intellectual property rules there. Yeah, yeah. That's the one thing for us. <laughs> like, uh, like always, uh, well, comparable to the UK, uh, the, the Netherlands is uh, walking the, the neoliberal uh, path. And uh, in, in the Netherlands, the, the, the facilities... Um, I think that they were erected in the 1950s to mass produce uh, vaccines. They were just privatized. Uh, so it's a, a weird time to be doing that. Uh, but yeah, m- maybe we could turn to um, yeah, what, what could be regarded as a space of hope. Uh, in, in your book, you, um, yeah, you, you discuss a report that uh, I believe your organization also co-authored uh, or your campaign for uh, that was written together with uh, Mato Kato and was titled uh, The People's uh, Prescription. Um, could you perhaps uh, yeah, give us more details on uh, so what is in this, uh, what is this program about? How, how, how can you use that to transform things for the better? Just very briefly in between, sorry, Nick, if anyone else has a question, because we're sort of going to wrap up from Rodrigo and me. Please put your question in the Q&A tab. We already have one question there, but we could have some more. Nick. Thanks. So so Mariana Masakato, as you know, is, is very keen on this idea that it is not, she wants to dispel this myth that innovation and creativity comes from the private, private sector entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I, I mean, her argument is basically it doesn't. It comes from large amounts of public sector money and, you know, strong objectives or missions, as she calls them, which the public sector um, sets. And so she thinks pharmaceuticals are an amazing example of quite how bad um, the private sector is when it comes to innovation and creativity. You know, the most risky part of almost all drugs that are invented um, is done by the public sector. So her argument is there is, and and particularly, and I think this is really going with the grain of the time, economics in the times um, at the moment. Uh, Her her argument is if we want cutting edge drugs tomorrow, we've got to set some missions to, to, to create those drugs, we've got to put the money behind it, but we've also got to put a regulatory system in place that means that you know any resulting intellectual property cannot simply be privatized and and you know uh, uh, we allow a bunch of investors to essentially max out what they can make on it. You know there needs to be a completely different way of, of, of doing this. Um, and so we wrote, wrote this report for what that could look like. What a, what what a government coming to power? What kind of a framework could they set to do this? Um, and sure, you know it might cost them more in terms of the public money they need to bring in the first place. But at the end of the day, they wouldn't be paying twice the things because they would then be able to put conditions upon any drugs that came out of that research. So it wasn't simply possible for someone to walk away with the intellectual property and charge whatever the market will bear for the next 20 years for it. Um, so it's 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 an appealing case, I think, um, for um, decision makers. Yeah, I, I would also argue, and there's some of it in there, there needs to be public options. Like you were just talking, I mean, our government did the same with vaccine manufacturing, privatized the, the vaccine manufacturing facility that we'd finally got ready by the end of the pandemic. They privatized it. It's now sitting multiple. You know, a private investor's taken it over. They're not really interested in, in making uh, vaccines, it seems. Um, they're interested in seeing what they can get um, on, on on the market um, for, by, by I don't know, selling it or taking it apart. I don't know what they're doing with it. But anyway, it's not doing anything. Um, this is crazy because but at the end of... Doesn't this also go a bit to the heart of the of the problem of monopoly power? That uh, there's many problems involved with monopoly power: uh, prices, uh, productivity declines. Uh, but yeah, it is. It also 
it contradicts with with democracy and the democratic decision making, and it leads to state capture. Eventually, large corporations setting their own rules. So, isn't this the terrain we are? Yeah, where the problem lies that these these are such a big corporations that that they basically set their own rules. And uh, yeah, it is very hard in that yeah in that structure to change anything. It is hard. I'm not you know I'm not saying it's it's it, it's easy, but that's why I do think we need the public option in there. Because otherwise, you are reliant. I mean, look, what we found with COVID was all these companies, like I said at the beginning, had kind of um, degraded their productive capacity because there wasn't enough money made in in factories just pumping this stuff out. Um, and, and yet, we put nothing else in place to replace them. You know, decision makers still kind of believed their own rhetoric that the market would provide, even though we could see they were scaling back their productive capacity and their research and development and whatever. Research and development, we did, we did put money in to make to uh, to to um, to mean that you know there was still stuff you know in the pipeline. But when it came to manufacturing, we did very, very little. And 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 so what that meant was we were dependent on it. You know, they helped they had they had us over a barrel essentially when the pandemic started. We can't let that happen again. And again, I mean I'm actually going to look to the United States of somewhere I think there's something quite positive happening. Initially I mean, the, the, the problem with insulin is partly intellectual property, but you know, it's a bit more complicated than that. But anyway, there are huge monopolies on insulin, despite the fact it's been around for more than 100 years, right? Which means that most Americans can't, you know, who, who need insulin struggle to afford it and, and have to ration, which is a, a, great, a great cost to their health and, and, and possibly even their lives. California has now said, to hell with this, we just need to produce this stuff at cost. And they've put 100 billion on the table and they've said, we're going to get a nonprofit to manufacture this stuff. I think it should have been you know, completely public. But anyway, they've gone with a non-profit company which is manufacturing this stuff. Seven other states in the US have now said they're going to do the same. Now, this is the heart of free market capitalism, where they're essentially saying, we're going to we're, we're, we're going to have at cost production of medicines paid for by the public, um, available for anyone who needs it. That I, I think that represents an enormous change. Um, and I think it's something we've all got to learn from. And there's there's some real hope there and 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 some stuff I think to get stuck into in terms of campaigning for a better system. So before we go to the audience, we also have a question from uh, Jenny from our team. Uh, and she's asking whether there's a role for antitrust legislation at the moment. So we're also going to discuss uh, these things in the next episode. But would it make sense, you think, to break companies up? Uh, and, and is that feasible, uh, let's say, in the next, well, five years? I, I guess the EU needs to decide upon that, right? It absolutely is, and I think there is some appetite for it. Again, you see a bit more appetite in the US for this, where, um, of course, the, the, the focus everywhere is on tech and, and the size and power of the tech companies, but far too, um, there have been um, recent mergers and acquisition and, and that have been uh, halted or, or under investigation um, in the United States, and that's really important. I mean, these companies have been getting more and more and more powerful and bigger and bigger and bigger since the Second World War. Really, it was, in the sec- it was after the Second World War that they... Um, that, that, that they managed to bring together lots of different bits of the production chain so that right from research and development through to selling the pills, you had one company sitting on that. Um, and of course, in the age of, of, of neoliberalism, those mergers and acquisitions just got greater and greater and greater. And, and again, of course, that means that the, that the power these corporations hold over society isn't just about you know the fact that they have monopoly rights to produce a specific medicine. It is the fact that there are there are not very many of these companies left anymore. I mean, they are bigger and bigger, huger and huger companies. And so, when they make a decision about actually, it's not profitable to be in vaccines uh, anymore, that's a huge problem because you don't have anybody else who's 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 saying, "Well, don't worry about it. We can make those." Um, you know, we are dependent on it. So, I absolutely think um, antitrust law is a really important part of this equation. Yeah, maybe we can go to uh, to a question uh, by a participant um, that's it's named Kade. I don't know exactly if it's an organization or a person, but the question is uh, reads: uh, How do we campaign effectively to resist big pharma without any wins being co-opted by the far right? And maybe you can take into account European elections coming up. Yeah. And, yeah, and, that's and, a good and German elections and uh, many elections. In the US and many <laughs> yeah. and many and many, yes. <laughs> yeah. Election so, disaster year. <laughs> it's a really good question. I don't know if, in, if, if part of that question also refers to some of the conspiracy theories uh, around uh, medicines, uh, vaccines, and so on. Yeah. 
Um, because obviously, yes, it a, does. Uh, yeah. He or she um, yeah. states. So that was a huge problem, right? I mean, you know, uh, we were campaigning on this through the pandemic. And it, I mean, I remember going on you know, an online protest and we had a real protest. And I remember being cheered on by some people who were vaccine skeptics. And then they kind of realized what we were calling for. And they were like, oh, no, they're pro vaccine. We don't, we don't, we don't like them. It, it got very confusing. Um, and I think for many people, you know, we're, we're talking about why the pharmaceutical industry structurally works in this way. And of course, anybody who um, is inclined towards conspiracy theories can use that to, you know, make up a story about, you know, how this company is run by, uh, I don't know, lizards or pedophiles or whatever, um, who are trying to, to, to poison us all. So, yeah, one of my arguments around all of this actually is the whole structure of the industry does not help at all um, in terms of our ability to, to, to convince people um, that many of these vaccines are a good thing. And the structure creates um, conspiracies almost. So it, it certainly creates a lot of suspicion. Um, and I think quite rightly. So actually one of the, for me, part of this campaign is precisely about saying this is science, technology, and medical innovation, which is too important to be left to enormous monopolies to profiteer of and to profit from. I mean, that's got to, be, you said to Rodrigo earlier that so much of this is actually about democracy when it comes down to it. And I think that's exactly right. You know, in this country, I, and it, it's, I guess it's worked in a similar way throughout other European countries too. After the Second World War, we there was a huge movement and a big argument around you know, whether you live or die when you're when you're ill, whether you get treated and how you get treated should not be dependent on the money in your pocket. It should not be dependent on on how wealthy or poor you are. And we created the national health system and and, 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 and most people in, in, in Britain still believe the National Health Service is you know, probably the pinnacle of what a civilized government has ever done in this country. And despite all attempts to privatize it, they've not quite been able uh, to take it off us. Um, I, I think those kind of arguments where you bring down, you know, so what I say now is nurse, it, it's, it's taken for granted that nurses and doctors and whatever, they don't, they, they, don't, they don't work for us personally, depending on how much you pay them. And the treatment you get is what you need. Why is it that we accept that, but we the, but, but we seem to think it's okay that the medicines that are administered in those hospitals are created in the most cutthroat capitalist way you can possibly imagine? It doesn't make sense. So how can you make a kind of democratic argument? And I think that's beginning to happen from what I've seen in the EU as well. So I know there's a conference coming up in a, in a couple of months' time around public pharmaceuticals in the EU where I think you know experts, academics, health practitioners, I mean, the thing's being run by some doctors, I think. Um, are saying we we need to make medicines democratically uh, in the public interest, and for me that is you know okay. It, it is clearly a stronger argument where there's a case of a medicine you can't get hold of because of this particular intellectual property over here. But I think there are stronger long-term arguments that we can make um, that say the medicine system that we need and that we want and that we can create is part and parcel. Or building a democratic culture. But, uh, 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 would you say that, yeah, uh, basically it has gone too far? Uh, it, it, this pharmaceutical system uh, is not working. Uh, it, uh, it wasn't working for a long time for the global south. But now, increasingly, as we are seeing the consequences for the global north, that we are seeing these spaces of hope emerging, of changes in the global north, but also in the global south, you were mentioning. Uh, yeah, new production and and and, and trade uh, facilities uh, being set up by South Africa, Argentina, and so on. So, is it basically that yeah, the system went too far in 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 in, in uh, and 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 that this is creating these changes? Well, it's eaten itself. I mean, I think it's true of a lot of capitalism. Capitalism is eating itself. Right? And certification, and, and, Corey would call it. And certification, <laughs> right? Exactly. And and I, I think it's a recognition of that amongst. You know, even some people who quite like the system. So, I mean, you know, I, I see, you know, I mean, I read the, the Financial Times. I think it's a really interesting paper to know what investors are thinking and so on. But, you know, there's an editorial line in the Financial Times for the last few years now, which is kind of like what I would call an enlightened capitalism. But actually, yeah, it's, it's gone too far. And, and if you simply allow these individual capitalists to do anything they want, the whole system is coming down. So for them, there is a reason for a government being able to take a step back and say, in the interest of the whole system, we need to regulate this in a different way. Now, we, we may not want that system at all. We may want a fundamentally different system, but, but clearly the fact that argument is happening gives us a space to begin 
arguing for that. And I think with pharmaceuticals, you know, you have some really surprising people. I mean, we've got somebody in the UK called Jim O'Neill. He used to work for Goldman Sachs. He was a big wig at Goldman Sachs. And he uh, coined the term BRICS. You know him, right? And he's in the British Parliament, and he was a conservative. I mean, he's not anymore, but he was a conservative sitting in our, in our House of Lords. Um, and he was trying to get antibiotic research done in, the, in, in, in Big Pharma, and he, he put this incentive framework into place, blah, blah, blah. Five years later, he comes back. What have you done? And he knows they've done nothing. And he says, I don't believe a word you people say. Frankly, I think part of this industry should just be nationalized. That's, that's someone on the right, center right of the political spectrum, simply recognizing this does not work for you know, how we want society to be in 20, 30, 40 years time. So I think there are interesting alliances. I think there are interesting ways of convincing people um, that we need really quite big change here. And that also means that we can sort of operate around the WTO or do we really need to tear down the WTO before we oh. can actually make this happen? I think this is a great question, and I think it's something we as campaigners need to think more about. My experience of the People's Vaccine Campaign in the pandemic is that it is going to be very, very hard to get agreement at the WTO uh, to rip up deals that were made in the mid to late 90s. It was great. We were trying to stop these deals happening in the first place. I think that's what those of us old enough who, who remember fighting against globalization when it was when it was you know, being constructed. We needed to stop some of this stuff happening. We did stop stop some of it happening. We didn't stop all of it happening by a very large margin. I, I, I don't think globalization is going to be untangled um, simply by going back to those forums and trying to pressure governments there to untangle them. They're too, there's too many vested interests. And I think it is going to be untangled by people simply doing things differently. Uh, at a national level, first of all, but hopefully as much as possible in the South African model cooperating. And particularly, I think, southern countries cooperate because they have very little to lose um, in terms of cooperating around medical research development and manufacturing the way South Africa is doing. I think that's going to be absolutely vital. So regional cooperation and South-South cooperation, I think, is going to be an absolutely vital way to overcome the rule of the WTO and its agreements. I think I think we need to wrap up, um, Sarah. Yeah. Um, well, there's one more question in the in the Q and A. Oh, so yeah. maybe Nick, if you can answer it within a minute, then we can still do it. The question is from uh, Miguel van den Bedem. What kind of reaction could one expect from pharmaceutical lawyers if a non-profit organization would go to court to condemn a certain pharmaceutical company for taking too much profit on a medicine for a rare disease, causing the loss of budget for national health care? Well, that's a great question. And there is a case at the moment in the Netherlands, um, I believe, which has been brought by some uh, by a nonprofit uh, over the drug Hemira, anti-inflammatory, it, you know, one of the most expensive drugs in the world, like just ludicrous amounts of money it costs and most health systems have to ration it. Um, and they are taking a case to say um, you have profiteered um, of, of public insurance um, money. So we'll see what happens. And I think there are some guys in Belgium doing the same thing. We haven't tried it yet, but I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. Well, let's hope there will be uh, an outcome soon and a precedent for more cases to follow. So, yeah, on a positive note, and actually a lot of positive notes, I noticed, Nick, I mean, a lot of good examples of how change is actually happening on the ground. We'd because like to, it is so bad. Because it's so bad. You know, <laughs> and certification. It's like, yeah, <laughs> maybe Marx was right after all. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep it there. So, but thanks a whole lot, Nick. Uh, super interesting, very clear uh, recording of this session will be put online as well as a podcast version. And thank you all, audience, for participating in this third webinar of our crash course series on rentier and monopoly capitalism. We will have uh, a fourth and final webinar in this series on February 29 at 4 o'clock with Angela Wigger on monopoly power and EU competition policy. And Angela is an associate professor on global political economy at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. So please join us for that final session. And in general, if you want to uh, keep uh, be updated on Crash Course, sign up for our newsletter at crashcourseeconomics.org. Uh, and I'd like to thank the team and Nick uh, once again for this uh, fabulous uh, Crash Course and hope to see you on another occasion. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.